and welcome to podcast Bridging Voices, the new online discussion forum of the Multinational Development Policy Dialogue of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation in Brussels. My name is Louis Mourier, Program Manager for Climate Policy at the Foundation, and today we are discussing the issue of carbon pricing in the Global South. Just a few weeks ago, on the 20th of April, we organized a webinar on global carbon pricing, where our speakers agreed that conventional carbon pricing instruments, such as emissions trading systems and carbon taxation, are critical tools to mitigate climate change. Very much in line with that, last week, German Chancellor Angela Merkel highlighted at the Petersburg Climate Dialogue that she hopes that as many countries as possible will go for carbon pricing, including in the global south. But introducing carbon pricing schemes in developing countries is no easy thing to do. It requires substantial institutional capacities, strong enforcement mechanisms, and transparent political leadership. And none of that exists in abundance in the, close, in the global south, especially at a time when we're in the midst of a massive economic crisis due to COVID-19. Therefore, we have to ask, can we simply apply carbon pricing instruments that are used in the global north to developing countries? How effective and fair are conventional carbon pricing instruments in LDCs? And how can we strengthen the EU's development climate policy nexus, making it more tailor-made and responsive to the needs of individual developing countries? These are some of the questions that we would like to address today with our guests. With us today is Vicky Pollard, Acting Deputy Head of Unit for International Carbon Markets at DG Klima of the European Commission. Warm welcome to you, Vicky. Thank you, Louis. And Andrew Gilda, Director of Climate Legal at Climate Consultancy in South Africa, who already joined us as a panelist on the 20th of April. Uh, thank you, Louis, and thanks for the uh, invitation and the pleasure to be speaking to Vicky. Great. Let's get right into the discussion to not lose any, any, any further time. Um, Andrew, in your recent research, you put into question whether conventional carbon pricing schemes, such as carbon taxes and ETS, are actually applicable to developing countries. While in the developed world, carbon taxation and ETS may have worked pretty well in many circumstances, you say that these schemes may not be necessarily the best way forward for carbon pricing in the global south. Can you clarify a bit how you get to that conclusion and what exactly is your criticism? Sure. So thank you for the question. Um, I suppose if we go back to the fundamentals of what, um, what mechanism is chosen for a particular economy, um, the, the questions that one asks um, are, among the questions that, that one asks are, what are the economic circumstances within the country? Um, what might be the emissions per capita or per GDP? And to what extent or what level of sophistication um, are the institutional structures within those economies that could deal with something as complicated as managing an ETS or indeed a carbon tax. The idea then that one simply takes those uh, uh, um, mechanisms and applies them in developing and least developed countries, particularly countries in Africa, which is um, the continent that is the, the, the major focus of what uh, climate legal does. Um, in, in order to apply the same solutions, you need um, at least similar or a, or a parity of conditions in those economies that would justify the implementation of ETS and carbon taxes. What we have found um, doing work, and I will uh, immediately uh, say to you and concede that the work is high level at this point. What we have found that while the discussion around the broad topic of carbon pricing mechanisms or approaches acknowledges that ETS and carbon taxes are two of a, um, a suite of mechanisms that might apply. When it comes down to practical advice given to developed, developing sorry, and least developed countries, the tendency seems to be to default to ETS and carbon tax. Um, there, there are possibly a number of reasons for that. First of all, uh, two, the, two Im immediately that spring to mind. First of all, ETS and carbon taxation has been used um, for a longer period of time than any of the other mechanisms that we can talk about, about other mechanisms and, and what they might constitute. But because ETS and carbon taxation have been used longer, there is a greater level of certainty and information about how to implement those, um, those approaches and 
what consequences one can expect. By contrast, because there is much uh, less implementation of other mechanisms, there is a concomitant um, lower level of information. Um, what this all suggests to me is, is that the questions we need to be asking about what are appropriate mechanisms in the developing world and the least developed world, those questions need to be um, more nuanced and go to greater depth of understanding and analysis before we simply default to ETS and carbon tax. And I realize I'm using the word default and it's, it's probably mildly provocative for a reason. Um, I will acknowledge though that there are likely to be reasons why that default happens. So, so Andrew, uh, thank you very much for that overview and for your, for your insight. If I understand you correctly, there is a certain tension between effectiveness on the one side and appropriateness on the other. So a conventional carbon pricing instrument, such as an ETS or a carbon tax, may be an effective tool in general, but it may not be appropriate in developing country contexts. Um, Vicky, over to you. Do you share Andrew's assessment? Are we on the wrong path if we universally apply developed country carbon pricing schemes to the global south? And is there indeed a tendency, as Andrew said, for carbon taxation and ETS to be, to be proposed as default mechanisms in most circumstances? I think I'd, I'd like to take a step back um, and talk about assumptions around global carbon pricing. We often hear people talk about achieving a global carbon price. And I think what we need to be clear is that um, we're really talking about an international carbon price because um, it's something which is very determined by individual circumstances and which um, will evolve through um, nation states or regions developing their own systems bottom up. Um, I would also, I think it's also important that to, to, to discuss what we mean by the, the global south. Um, the global yeah. south is also very varied. Um, and now under the Paris Agreement, we're in a world where um, commitments are based on that nationally determined contributions, which are uh, a country's own assessment of their ability to act on climate change. And so I think it's, it's hard to make generalizations about the global south and the ability to um, take up uh, different mechanisms. But I agree that um, ETS, carbon taxes, are one of a broad sweep of me suite of measures. Um, It's something that we have a lot of experience on in Europe because of our history. Um, the EU ETS has now been running 15 years. It's uh, a big system which is working well to reduce our emissions, but also um, to do so in a flexible way to allow us to be more ambitious and at the same time raise revenues which are, are being uh, used to a large extent to address climate change, both in Europe but also internationally. So it has many benefits and uh, we think it's very important that um, we work with others who are willing to, to take on those types of measures to, to uh, make sure that they are developing policies, uh, carbon pricing policies that work for them um, to meet their commitments. So in the work that we do, we tend to work with those countries who have a political commitment and who have the capacity or who are ready to take on board the capacity building, so have sufficient capacity for us to build the capacity to um, have functioning um, carbon markets or carbon pricing. Now that yep. excludes yep. Qu quite a few countries that we're not in a position to, to do so. And I think that clearly there we, we need to take different approaches. Um, and um, in terms of the work we do, I think the work on carbon pricing is just a very small part of the wider carbon, uh, climate diplomacy work, um, which the European Union has been doing for several years and is now accelerating, increasing. And of the um, um, money that's provided or uh, um, financing from uh, um, public finance, which is going towards um, developed countries um, um, and uh, um, to, to support um, uh, climate resilience and, and, and climate uh, and mitigation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, 
Thanks so much for that, Vicky. Very, very interesting. And um, Andrew, again, back to you. Um, Vicky just talked about, um, about the advantages of ETS and carbon taxes, but also about um, how the EU is already supporting capacity building on carbon, ta on carbon taxation, ETS, but also other, other carbon pricing mechanisms um, in the global south even though we can't generalize, as, as uh, Vicky rightly, rightly noted. Um, but Andrew, let me get back, on you, back to you on that topic. If you, if you allow me to be a bit provocative, um, your deliberations and your research basically amount to substantial criticism of existing initiatives that support carbon pricing in the global south. For example, the World Bank's partnership for market readiness is strongly focused on ETS and carbon taxation and less so on alternative forms of carbon pricing. Let me be straightforward. Are you implying that these donor-funded initiatives are fundamentally misguided? And in your eyes, what would be alternative carbon pricing instruments that are both effective and appropriate in developing country contexts? So let's examine uh, what Vicky has said and, and what, I've, what I've said. So yes, it, it is a criticism. You are correct. The criticism, though, is not necessarily um, about the choices made. It's about the questions asked to arrive at the choices. So let's take two notions um, that, uh, one that Vicky has mentioned and one that you've mentioned. So Vicky mentioned nationally determined contributions and made the, the very appropriate point that because they are nationally determined, um, by implication, they are a statement of what the country thinks it can do. First uh, idea. And the second idea is you mentioned the World Bank's partnership for market readiness. Now, the, the, the outcomes, or, or put it this way, the, the, um, the ambition expressed in a nationally determined contribution, possibly as informed by work done under the partnership for market readiness, looks like a statement from the country but if you are dealing with a country that is, and, and let's be clear, I agree with, with Vicky and yourself, there needs to be differentiation in um, approaches taken to different countries, and that's precisely the point. We cannot generalize. And so if the generalization leads to um, a default application of ETS and carbon taxation, yes, I am critical. But let's go back to the underlying question. How does a least developed country without high levels of sophistication and climate and carbon pricing get to the point that they make a statement that they then own as their nationally determined contribution? Well, the answer to that is quite often a donor organization like the World Bank will um, advertise for appropriate technical work to be done that is put out um, to an international competitive bidding process and international consultancies invariably win that work. And those consultancies in the main tend to be from developed countries, which means that they come often with a developed country notion. Um, again, I am generalizing. I will, I will grant you that. The, 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 the point I'm making, though, is that um, just because a nationally determined contribution is stated as being owned by a particular least developed or developing country does not mean that the nuts and bolts and the practicalities of that um, NDC um, express precisely what is possible within, within that country. It may well be that decision makers or policy makers within those countries have accepted the informed advice of a developed world consultancy and gone, well, yes, that seems reasonable. Let's do that. My question again is, let's look at the underlying reasons for why that um, solution was constructed in the first place. Is it appropriate to that country? And so, yes, I'm asking the question, are NDCs, notwithstanding the fact that they are stated as being owned by the countries, are they all um, and completely and comprehensively appropriate to that country. We have found that that, that in fact is not the case. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I think Andrew, we, we, 
I think that's something actually we, we well understood. So there are no one size fits all solutions. And too often, apparently, there's a tendency to use developed country schemes and approaches and simply apply them to, to uh, developing countries or LDCs. But coming back to the question that I, um, the second question that I ask you, what are good and functioning and appropriate alternative carbon pricing instruments that can be used in developing country context? Can you name and perhaps explain a few uh, alternative solutions sure. and i mean they they are not uh, they are not unusual uh, um anybody who who has read uh, um to any depth in the carbon space will, will know them let's talk about ets and cap uh, taxation very very quickly um they are appropriate and in highly industrialized economies with um, a number of very large point sources of greenhouse gas emissions if you're an economy that does not have that kind of um uh, 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 series of point sources of greenhouse gas emissions, um, then what, what do we do in those economies? Let's take a country like Ghana. Ghana has a, um, a very large um, sink capacity, and I, I realize there are, there are queries around sink capacity, but let's just take it as an example. Andrew, 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 let, let yes. me interrupt. Can you totally explain for our listeners who, not, who are not all uh, climate policy experts, uh, what are sink capacities? Sure. So in this instance, in the Ghanaian instance, a sink uh, re refers to a mechanism, usually a natural mechanism, that um, as a result of its normal operation, um, absorbs uh, carbon dioxide. So um, old growth forests have long been acknowledged as um, very important international sinks. I mean, your listeners will uh, no doubt have been aware of the, the, the current discussions um, uh, that are ongoing around Brazil and, you know, the, the incumbent administration's view that the, the Amazon is, is not, in fact, a, um, um, an asset uh, that uh, should be applied for the benefit of, of humankind in general or, or worldwide. It is, in fact, an asset that needs to be applied purely for uh, Brazilian economic development. Okay, I, I understand that. But there is significant value in those old growth, for, old growth forests um, that will allow for absorption of carbon dioxide. Let's go back to Ghana. If you go into Ghana and you say, well, the solution from a carbon taxation, uh, sorry, a carbon uh, pricing mechanism perspective is you need to have an emissions trading scheme. Well, what emissions are you going to trade? Who are going to be the parties that will trade? That's an important question in the yeah. context of the fact that the, the, the most significant value that Ghana represents from a carbon asset perspective is the ability of its forests to absorb CO2. That is as valuable an asset as being able to reduce industrial greenhouse gas emissions in a developed country. At the moment, though, although there are certainly efforts in those countries to utilize those capacities, um, there is less attention being paid to how that kind of example can be wo woven together with other approaches, for example, um, landscape management, or indeed results-based options into a, a fabric or a tapestry, if you like, of approaches rather than going, well, the thing we know uh, most and the thing we can implement easiest is a tax. So let's do that. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Ren, for, for, for giving us some, some, some ideas which could be alternative solutions to ETS and, and carbon taxation. Uh, um, but I think your, your example of Ghana actually leads me to another topic that we would like to um, address today. And that's the topic of climate justice and fairness. As you said, um, when we're dealing with countries like Ghana, we're in completely different contexts that cannot be compared to um, highly industrialized, industrialized countries as we have them in the European Union, for example. Um, so beyond the question whether individual carbon pricing schemes are applicable to developing countries, carbon pricing as such remains a very contentious issue in the global south. It raises concerns over industrial development, international competitiveness, and climate justice. Uh, Vicky, several studies say, for example, that carbon prices need to amount to at least 35 to 40 euros to incentivize strong reduction 
emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. I think, do you, I think you agree with me that it's not realistic to expect LDCs to pay such a high carbon price anytime soon. And if that's the reality, what could be appropriate and fair instruments to incentivize greenhouse gas emissions reductions in developing countries in the next years? I think, to be clear, we're not asking LDCs to pay 35 euros per tonne. Um, countries where that carbon price exists, it exists because there is domestic legislation which uh, puts in place a measure like a carbon tax, an ETS, um, or other forms of, of regulation that have an effective carbon price, um, which mean that uh, those active in, those in the markets in question have to pay that price. The way the carbon price has worked internationally um, outside those jurisdictions has usually been as a guide to those investing on what the future carbon price should be or what carbon price to factor into investment decisions. Of course, that depends on whether they expect there to be a carbon price in that particular area or not, or an effective carbon price. Because I think um, what we need to be clear is that um, while um, we, we see an international uh, price developing through gradual adoption of carbon pricing systems like ETS, like taxes, but in particular ETS, which allows systems to um, cooperate and link up over time. It's only going to be some of the, the larger emitters. Um, the, the, the effect of um, um, carbon pricing otherwise has been to work through um, offsetting mechanism, international offsets and others, um, which at the moment, uh, the environment for is changing. So we have a negotiation on the future rules um, under the Paris Agreement for uh, exchanges, basically carbon markets, uh, so transfers of emissions units between countries and how those will be accounted for. Um, but um, the debate is shifting away from a debate which is purely about emissions reductions to one in which we're talking about um, moving to climate neutrality. So that's net zero um, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, for the European Union, what we're looking at um, in the uh, European Green Deal is a commitment to climate neutrality by 2050. And the debate with other parties is about how we all get there globally. And so that has an implication for um, what that means in terms of um, carbon markets, but also other measures. Um, and so the world in which um, there was demand for, for example, credits issued under what was called the, the, the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism, under the, the, the Kyoto Protocol, we're, we're now in a world where we're moving away from, from that approach where we would use uh, uh, have uh, CDM credits used in the EU ETS for compliance to a system where compliance in the EU's own ETS is purely through domestic action. So, and that means that uh, we have to find alternative uh, means for carbon markets to work. Um, and also to make sure that those carbon markets are um, incentivizing action which really helps countries reduce their emissions and meet their commitments and to develop sustainably. It means also that we need to make sure that um, they're effective in meeting the needs of countries where the need is greatest for that investment. Um, and I think in particular, if you look in, at the past, a lot of the flows from uh, international carbon markets were going to, again, to countries with more capacity. Um, and there were fewer flows of, um, for example, money via the CDM to LDCs. I think that this is the sort of thing that we need to address and to look at, um, not just within the international uh, um, carbon market, but also through other forms of financing coming in, how we have policies which work in countries to create the right incentives because a carbon price is about an incentive yes. and what incentives can you put in place in different systems, different economies? Yes. And what's thank needed. You, so, yeah. If I may pick up of course, of course. from that. So, so thank you, Vicky. That's a really important point. 
So let's let's tie this together um, around the, the Ghanaian example, but, but let, let's be clear. I mean, there are there are other examples. So um, in a situation where traditionally forest land has been cleared to make way for farmland or factory installations and the like, how would you provide an incentive to a country with um, an old growth forest? not to cut down that forest, but rather to um, retain the forest and manage the forest so that its ability to um, absorb carbon dioxide, so as a contribution to that, that carbon neutrality that, that Vicky mentioned, that global carbon neutrality, how do you incentivize a country to keep their forest, to manage it better, in order to contribute to global carbon neutrality. You can't expect that country to undertake those actions of better management without some sort of incentive. You can't say to Ghana, listen, for the, for the general good of humankind, you cannot develop. You must in fact stay in a state of um, a developing country so that uh, as a contribution to international carbon neutrality. What you need to do is you provide an incentive and in the market context, that is a financial incentive, in which case then it is important to be able to provide, a, to ascribe a value to the, the sick capacity, again, I, I'll, I'll use that, that term, of those forests. The way we, we know how to do that easiest is to represent that sink capacity in tons of carbon dioxide equivalent mitigated and to put a price to it. There are, there are two consequences of doing that. Firstly, in countries where economic indicators uh, might be less prevalent, so where there might be fewer um, sources of um, asset value um, within the country, if you ascribe a price to a forest, what you've done is you've created an in-country economic indicator. So you've valued an asset indexed to an international price that now provides that country with um, an extra financial or economic means to uh, pursue its development ambition. How do you get the finances into that country? you allow for the, that sink capacity, for that carbon value to be utilized by other countries on the payment of a price. So there is a financial flow into that country which um, can perhaps support development. And I, I uh, um, take on board completely Vicky's point about the need therefore, and, and the ties to a comment I made earlier, for capacity building and um, the development of expertise in those countries to understand precisely what it is they've got and how they can use it. I yeah. have a caveat there, and the last comment though, is that that capacity building is very often framed as the um, requirement of the, 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 the country or the, the block or the organization that is providing the funding or the financial support for that capacity building. There are much more fundamental questions that need to be asked in country across all 193 countries of the Framework Convention on Climate Change and the answers might be different times 193. We've never gone to that level of, of detail to this point. Yeah, thank you to, to both of you for that very important discussion about uh, the right incentives, financial incentives, but also about noting that uh, when we want to get to a global carbon market under uh, the Paris Agreement, or if we want to strengthen carbon pricing um, across the world, capacity building is of major importance. Um, 
perhaps, but, but just, just a follow up question, because some developing countries have already uh, implemented a financial incentive um, using their capacities uh, and their institutions that they have built over the past decades. Um, and they have implemented some conventional carbon pricing schemes, for example, South Africa, but still um, pr carbon prices at the moment across uh, the global south remain pretty low. In South Africa, for example, uh, I think uh, the, the, the carbon tax stands at around five euro. Um, so the question is, perhaps to you, Andrew, is there a risk that carbon pricing will make the global south simply less competitive without having any tangible effect on climate change? And that, of course, would be another major concern on climate justice in the whole question of carbon pricing. Um, yes, exactly. And so uh, what that then suggests is, is yet another fundamental question um, around how one designs the, um, the, the future. And if, if, if one is speaking from a, um, a developing country perspective, as I am, then the question of climate justice is, is really important. Um, I, I mean, I hesitate to do this, but, but uh, uh, for example, if one takes the current debate in Europe around uh, carbon border tax adjustments and European countries simply impose border tax adjustments, so effectively that is a, an extra levy and a new tax on manufactured goods um, coming in from countries with um, higher levels of greenhouse gas emissions. So in, in, implicit in, in each manufactured unit is a higher level of greenhouse gas emissions. And those emissions are taxed at the border. What you will be doing if you do not moderate that sufficiently well, what you will be doing is imposing a competitive disadvantage on the exporting country. There is a lot of wisdom to border tax adjustments. The question is, if you're going to implement a, call, a, a border a tax adjustment, are you, is your premise simply to limit the import of um, carbon intensive goods into the receiving country, or are you also creating a system that allows for the exporting country to seek to reduce its carbon intensive economy so that it will remain competitive even in the face of border tax adjustment? That, that guides me directly to my next topic, actually. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, and, and I think, Vicky, you expected the question on the border carbon adjustment, since it's such a controversial policy across the world. Um, I don't want to get into complete details on the BCA, since we already discussed that during our webinar on the 20th of April. But still, uh, Vicky, you, you hear that the, the, the initiative still remains very controversial. And, and the question is, what will the EU do to ease these concerns of the global south? Uh, as for example, that all revenues earned uh, through the border carbon adjustment, uh, once it is implemented, should be rechanneled, redirected to, the, to, the, to developing countries, thereby increasing the EU's uh, climate finance. Is that something that the Commission is considering um, at the moment? Well, I think at the moment, uh, all that I can say is that the EU has committed to climate neutrality um, by mid-century, and that means a big increase um, in ambition. And while if trading partners of the EU, so countries who are uh, importing um, goods into the EU are not taking comparable climate action, there is a risk of carbon leakage. And I think this is what we're talking about. We're, we're talking about avoiding a situation where emissions reductions in the EU um, just lead to emissions increases elsewhere, which is just counterproductive. So. Um, in the European Green Deal, the announcement that the, the Commission will propose a carbon border adjustment mechanism is not about competitiveness, it's not about res revenue raising. The focus is to avoid carbon leakage and, inc and increasing global emissions. Um, it's very difficult for me to say at this stage what the CBA, the carbon border adjustment, would look like because it's in the initial um, uh, process of development. We have a better regulation process where there is a full stakeholder consultation to which people can contribute and there will be a full impact assessment. And, and these are the questions that would typically be addressed in, in that sort of impact assessment. 
The other thing to say is that the EU has always been a very staunch defender of rule-based uh, trade order, mm. and it will comply with international obligations um, and the rules of the WTO in particular. So it's, this is not about flouting the rules of international trade. Um, so um, I think on, in, 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 I think it's, it's important to, to, to understand what we're trying to do with the carbon border adjustment. Having said that, the EU is engaging in particular with the LDCs and the most vulnerable countries to help them address climate change, be it to reduce their own emissions or to adapt to um, the inevitable impacts of climate change, because there will be very serious impacts. And this is what it's really about. Um, and those impacts will affect the competitiveness of countries and it will affect their, their abilities to maintain jobs um, and to maintain revenues and, and, and their economic strength. And um, in that respect, you have to say that in parallel, the, the, the EU is, what, is the biggest donor in terms of international climate finance and public finance. Um, and um, so it, it's, I don't think you can look at either carbon pricing or the work to, to address carbon leakage um, without looking at the broader perspective, which is we do want to work with partners around the world, in particular the most vulnerable, um, to help them be uh, moved to, to transform their economies to be carbon neutral. And we think that's also important for their long-term competitiveness and strength as economies and their ability to meet the needs of their people. Yeah, great, Vicky. Thank you so much for your comments and also thank you for uh, for your commitment or for showing this commitment that the EU stays uh, fully in line with, with the multilateral trading regime and, and stays committed to support LDCs on their on their pathway to climate neutrality. And Andrew, I suggest perhaps that uh, when once the BCA is on its way or, or uh, you, 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 you just uh, you, you, uh, participate in the EU's consultation process, perhaps there is a chance for you to, uh, to make some suggestions. And the same for listeners as well. Yeah, for this as well, of course. Um, yeah, but um, while slowly coming to an end of our debate, um, let's talk a little bit more about uh, the EU's climate development policy nexus and what the EU is doing uh, um, in matters of, of carbon pricing for developing countries. Um, Vicky, as we, as we said before, the EU is a big supporter of the World Bank's Partnership for Market Readiness and also the International Carbon Action Partnership, both of which mostly promote um, ETS and carbon taxes. Um, taking into account our I would say very critical <laughs> contributions of Andrew today um, early in our discussion. Do you think there is a need to refine the EU's policy approach to carbon pricing in the global south? Do we need new policies that are more nuanced, more tailor-made to the specific needs of individual developing countries? Uh, I think, I mean, we're, we're involved in ICAP, we have been from the beginning, and ICAP is actually originally designed to bring together those countries working with a commitment on cap and trade for them to work together. So that's its history and therefore it's, it's in a way it's natural that it focuses on ETS and it has branched out to, into other areas of carbon pricing um, and offering capacity building and, ex, um, and opportunities for exchange and for policy makers. But it's, it is of course, it is focused on, on, on what we do uh, in, in more, um, more developed countries that have that capacity. The, the PMR, the Partnership for Market Readiness, again, was set up to help countries who were committed to looking at carbon pricing, but also had a certain level of capacity to, to, to look at carbon pricing mechanisms. And again, it was set up with those particular um, carbon pricing mechanisms in mind. However, it has provided a lot of support in terms of developing the basic infrastructure needed for functioning carbon pricing in, in, in many different forms. So for example, a lot of support for um, monitoring, reporting and verification. So that the means to get the basic data that you need to make carbon pricing work, because if you don't have data, it's yeah. very difficult to price something if you don't know what you're pricing. And so, yeah. um, and you need that system to be secure enough and not open to fraud and um, abuse. So um, it is also supported registries and other aspects, which are, whether they lead to an ETS or to a carbon tax or to another form of, of carbon pricing or carbon incentive, I think are useful activities. The, the PMR has been running for about 10 years now. It's now uh, developing, it's evolving, it's, it's entering a new phase where it's going to be more about 
uh, implementation. Um, and uh, but that's just uh, it's just beginning, so we don't know um, the exact form of that yet. Um, but I do agree that the, those mechanisms are not necessarily focused on um, all countries around the world. In fact, they're probably focused on a very small, small group of countries with, with high levels of capacity. And I think it is important to um, um, increasingly think about how we develop um, our approaches to work with LDCs, in particular Africa. The EU has a very strong focus on Africa, We're putting a lot of money into work on um, uh, how we support Africa in terms of climate action very broadly. Um, and I think it's very welcome to have this type of debate about what will really work for the countries in question and how it fits into the their wider sustainable development. And yeah. um, so I think it's not, a, it's, 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 these debates are, are, are welcome because we, 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 we focus on, on, on different countries in different ways. But um, there's, there's a huge potential to do a lot more, and we know that, and that's why we're increasing the, the climate diplomacy effort. Yes, great. Thank you so much. Um, Andrew, you, you just heard that um, apparently the Commission and the EU is, is increasing its focus on Africa in the, in, in the next years. So we, ba we basically heard where the EU's climate development policy nexus may be moving in matters of carbon pricing in the next years. Uh, perhaps one of the, the final question to you before I have to close um, the debate. Um, in your eyes, are there weaknesses in the EU's policy approach and which concrete expectations do you have do the developing countries have towards the EU in matters of carbon pricing? So, let, let, so I'm grateful for Vicky to, to have made the point that the, this kind of debate that we're having right now is really important. Um, and, and let me tie some threads together, Louis, in, in responding to your, to your query. So a, a very important statement from Vicky that um, something like the Partnership for Market Readiness has been supporting um, the development of expertise and mechanisms for monitoring, reporting, and verification um, in order to determine the extent of uh, possible carbon assets in particular countries so that they can be priced. Yes, that's exactly the point. We are in the process of doing it. We have not done it before. That is why this kind of debate is really important because this kind of debate will inform what happens in the future. So while something like the PMI has been essential to a number of countries, including my own, I mean, the, um, the, a lot of the um, underlying technical and intellectual support for the development of a carbon tax in South Africa has been from the PMI. But South Africa is an unusual case, even in Africa, because it has a large base of industrial emissions. The, 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 I suppose the point, my most important point, is just because a country doesn't have a large base of industrial emissions does not therefore mean that it does not have viable carbon assets that up until this point have not been priced. So the question is, if you are not looking at industrial emissions, what other things are you looking at? And I acknowledge the PMR is, is, is developing processes to look at those other things. And the outcome of that work, hopefully, will be to say, um, here are other carbon assets that we have not previously considered. They are not derived from industrial um, greenhouse gas emissions, in which case then the, the default or the traditional uh, ways to price those of taxation and ETS may not be appropriate, what are the other mechanisms that we can use? First point, to answer your specific question, um, which is what does one expect from the likes of, of the EU and, and developed country donors? So that's a bit of a loaded question, but, but <laughs> let, 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 let me try and answer it um, by giving yet another example. We did a, a, a piece of work looking at the question of access of sub-Saharan African countries to climate finance. And we focused on three barriers that are typically identified as barriers to countries' access. And, and those barriers are all ascribed to deficiencies within the recipient countries. So they are about expertise, they are about the characterization of need within that country, and they are about 
um, those countries' understanding of the, um, the available carbon finance and how to access it. Okay, fine, I accept that. But if you look at it just from the perspective of a deficiency within the recipient country, you are missing the point that those deficiencies are often a result of um, donor actions or donor requirements. So if you've got a relatively unsophisticated economy and institutional setup, it is counterproductive to expect the, the kind of levels of financial reporting that you would expect from a highly sophisticated, highly developed economy. Now, something like the Global uh, Climate Fund, the Green Climate Fund, sorry, the GCF, has in fact done its own internal research and has ad identified precisely that point as one of the reasons why the GCF is not getting the level of disbursement that it requires. So, so I'll, I will summarize. Among the findings of the GCF internal study are that the GCF's own policies need to be reconsidered. Okay, I, I like that. But if you look at the, the, the most um, obvious interventions that the GCF is, is, is driving around access, they are all focused on increasing capacity in, in, developed country, in developing countries. Um, we really need to turn the discussion around. We need to look at the discussion from the perspective of the recipient and not from the, the perspective of the provider of yeah. the finance. Yeah, great. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Andrew, for, for your final comments. I think that really gives us some, some food for thought and, and how to make um, EU climate finance, but also e the EU climate development policy nexus more um, receptive and adaptive to the needs and concerns of the global south. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our time is up. Uh, I think it was a very, very rich and enthusiastic, enthusiastic debate. So thank you very much to, to Vicky and, and Andrew. Uh, um, usually, probably you would receive uh, an applause, but that's not possible in podcasts. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you very much for, for joining us today, also to our listeners. Uh, that was just the start of our new podcast and uh, the multinational development policy dialogue of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. We'll be back very soon with a new, fresh discussion on uh, the EU Global South relations, bridging the gap between uh, EU institutions and um, policymakers from the Global South. So thank you very much and see you soon. We invite you to follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter and SoundCloud. You can find all the necessary links here in the description. Again, thank you very much for joining us today and stay tuned for the next podcast of the Multinational Development Policy Dialogue of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. Bye.